Teal Swan is a YouTuber and spiritual teacher. Whenever you're in any type of a situation or a setup or a relationship, could be even a job, you want to ask yourself, what am I giving up for the sake of this thing? We chat about what childhood experiences lead to creating narcissism, what a soul retrieval is and how you can do it, and if claims of remote viewing, ESP, and seeing ours are legitimate. I wanted to start with a video that I watched. It was Tony Robbins talking to Theo Vaughn. You may not have seen the podcast, but uh, this represents a way of being that I'd become very familiar with. Theo is opening up about low self-worth, and Tony is helping him to reframe and uh, address those feelings in a way that is one line that he says, those feelings are not your friend. We don't want to, you know, get close to those. Essentially, we want to have someone else steering. And uh, I've had a tremendous amount of value in my life from reframing, denying, and avoiding <laughs> certain feelings. And recently, via your stuff and a lot of other people, I've taken almost the opposite approach and started moving towards low self-worth, saying, yes, tell me your story. I'm not trying to get away from you. And so I'm curious, I don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. It seems like a huge part of my life got value from the reframe. So when is it appropriate to change a feeling, if ever? And when is it appropriate to sink in, move towards, open up, that sort of thing? Even in the premise of this question is an attitude that the emotion, the negative emotion is somehow against improvement. Mm. And that is not the case. So the best case scenario is to treat this like a one-two step. Whenever you've got like a painful emotion that's arising, there's information that's carried within that emotion and often aspects of self that very deeply need to be touched into. So let's say that you do that. It's, it's an assumption and a projection that when you do that, the emotion will only intensify and get worse. That's, I think that the law of attraction communities have made this the worst, if you want my honest truth, because it's this attitude that whatever you give your attention to becomes more. And this is yes. not actually how emotions work most especially when you're entering into them with the vibrational frequency of, of intention of caretaking an emotion or an intention of learning from something. Just the free will that comes with that conscious choice is changing your entire relationship to that emotion and is therefore acting as an elixir towards the emotion itself. People don't get stuck in emotions unless they're resisting that emotion. Emotions are very water-like. Some of them have more grip than others, but if you spend a lot of time with an emotion, exposing it to the light of consciousness, it doesn't stay like it is. Mm -hmm. So what will so why, what? Here, why would it appear, for instance, for someone like a Theo Vaughn who has struggled with his low self-worth for decades and decades? Because most people are like, wait a second, I've, I've been with my emotions for a no, long no, no, time. No, no, They're no, always no. plaguing me. Yeah. So can you no. talk about that? There's a very big difference between consciously going towards and into your emotions and forever, my emotions have just been taking me over. Like, it's this very, it's not, a, it's not a, the right relationship to have to your emotions. Most people who think they've been with their emotions have not been with their emotions. They've spent their whole life trying to run away from them. Mm -hmm. That's weird. That's like saying, ah, you don't understand. I've spent my whole life with dogs. But really the whole time you've been like, oh no, there's another one. Shut the door. Oh my mm -hmm. gosh, there's fur everywhere. You know, <laughs> we have this horribly adversarial relationship with our emotions and yet we have the audacity to essentially say, I've been with them. Um, no, people don't know how to be with emotions. That's the reality, because mm. we're not taught that. Why? Because our parents weren't. You know, if a little kid was upset and the parent sat down and said, I want to understand exactly what it is you're feeling right now. Oh, it makes sense that you were feeling that way. Why was that scary? You know, if there was a kind of a working with emotion, we wouldn't develop the terror towards our own emotion. It's when our mm -hmm. emotion is turned against that we learn how to react to our own emotion that way. And then we become stuck. Yeah. So let's go to, to childhood because I think you're probably the first person that uh, reframed how I understand personality dis disorders like uh, narcissism, sociopathy, all those sorts of things. I used to see them as these random lightning strikes that would just take a person and, you know, that's a narcissist. There's, there's someone with a social personality disorder. And uh, according to you and something that I've come to believe, they actually come very predictably from certain childhood experiences and res uh, predictable responses to those childhood experiences. So let's talk about those. And then generally for somebody who maybe isn't a narcissist, what they might find in themselves from their childhood. 
Okay, so which one do you want to start with? Because this is like, let's, so broad. Like, yes, yes. Let's do the ones that are, I think, most interesting, which is the narcissist. Like, what? Okay. how do these get, people get made? Or the codependent, for instance. Okay, so the, the codependent and the narcissist is essentially generated out of the exact same childhood experience, which is a dysfunctional family. When we use the word dysfunctional, what we mean is that the way that the members of this family behave is a detriment to each other rather than a benefit to each other. So inherently, it's not something that is working for any member of that group, right? And by the way, it's very easy to walk into a dysfunctional family and see the whole family system kind of orbiting around like an alcoholic or something like that and be like, well, it's only working for them. No, it isn't. In a dysfunctional family dynamic, even if the whole family revolves around the needs of one being, it's still not working for that person either, right? So in a dysfunctional family dynamic, you've got these very classic roles. doesn't matter where you go in the world, you're going to see these same roles, right? Um, you've got essentially the, the person who is in this narcissistic state, right, already. Um, they could be because of any number of different reasons. And that person is only thinking about themselves. They're literally stuck in a only it's all about me. So that person is going to look more on, on an overt way, like everything get, happens the way they want it to happen. Like everybody's just sort of kowtowing to whatever it is that they need. You know, it's like the whole family system is revolving around that one individual and their issues or their addiction or the way they need life to be, right? Um, then you've got the codependent. I'll explain how these are, are created in a minute. But then you've got the mm -hmm. codependent who is somebody who is all about themselves too, but it's not going to look like it on the surface. This person has created all kinds of strategies to get their needs met in manipulative ways. So they're just being narcissistic backdoor, right? Now, when kids are born to this environment, they are not looked out for. Why? Because they've got two parents who are, again, they've just found all these different ways to be for themselves, whether it's overt tyranny or whether it's creating huge consequences or whether it's manipulating via needs or, you know, you're, the list is endless. So very quickly, the children who are born into this environment learn I'm in trouble here because just like being born into a shark pit or being born into the reptile kingdom, it's like <laughs> I, I don't actually have genuine uh, advocacy here. It's pretty much every man for himself. And that's the, that's the emotional undertone of the entire family. That's the reality of what's going on, despite what you see on the surface, right? Because on the surface, we might see, ooh, the family's going for fun hunting trips together. Ooh, look, we all got matching t-shirts. But the, the underlying tone is, you got to find a way to fit in here very quickly to meet your needs because it's every man for himself. So what will happen is you'll usually have a child in that situation that cannot reasonably find a way to fit in. They can't find a way to please the parents. And because they can't find a way to please the parents, they can't create what's called confluence in a relationship. To imagine confluence, you just think about two, two rivers, right? Confluence is when they join like this. Now, every person is looking for that sensation in a relationship. That feels like mm -hmm. harmony. That feels like closeness. That feels like security. The child who is usually on the scapegoat spectrum, right, which is what we call them, comes into this family, can't find a way to create confluence with either parent for whatever reason. There's a lot of different reasons for that. And because of it, they learn, okay, well, if it's every man for himself, nobody's going to be here for me. I better start fighting. So this kid starts being like, all right, I'm not going to consider you guys. I'm going to consider me and I'm going to start being about me. And now that becomes the next narcissist. So the, the way that narcissism, as we would label it, generates is when a person can find no reasonable way to, to create confluence and therefore starts to go entirely for their own needs in a zero-sum game against other people. And then they get older and can find people who might be interested in finding confluence with them but can't shake that pattern that is so deeply ingrained. Well, I mean, they would find partners who continue the cycle. Mm-hmm. Like, you know, un they don't they don't really look at, at what is underneath all of it, which is the failure to create trust in a relationship. That's really what breaks the entire cycle is to have an experience of something that is the opposite of the zero sum game. Of course, we're all locked in this mentality that like narcissism as a as a personality disorder <clears throat> rather than an adaptive strategy is something that people will never go out of. And it's not true. It's a protection mechanism. Mm hmm. It's just that we tend to find our way into relationships that require the same protection mechanisms. This is part of what my whole job is about, right? Because 
if we create a way of, of protecting ourselves, we've like created this entire structure for the way we operate in the world that only makes sense in the context of that dysfunctional dynamic. Mm -hmm. If we take all of that into another uh, you know, type of environment, it doesn't work. And so we actually start to feel insecurity. And so we start to feel like, oh, well, the only place that I can actually make sense you know, as a being is in that very dysfunctional dynamic. Okay, so the codependent, I like, gotta go there too, because the codependent is the child who can figure out a way to create confluence with the parents. And, and so they are the ones who give up aspects of themselves in order to sneakily get their needs met. And they learn a pattern of chronic manipulation for the sake of their own needs. And it's very difficult for people to recognize. Why? Because on, at face value, they seem like the givers. This, this is the sweet kid. This is the real easy kid who's like, whatever you want, mom. You know, and so on the outside, we're going, that is the least self-centered child. Oh, no, 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 no. They're just as narcissistic as the rest of the family members. It's just they figured out whatever you want, mom, means extra candy, mm -hmm. cuddles, whatever other need they have. But I mean, that person then, they find, they usually find somebody with a very strong personality, another person who's usually on the narcissistic end of the spectrum, right? Because they're like, oh, I know how to work with this. <laughs> oh my God, you know your favorite sport? That's fu funny. It's like my favorite too. Right? And then, all, and then they sort of, they create false confluence in their relationships, which turns into its own hell. And it's like this whole cycle of, of uh, dysfunction repeats. Got it. So those are extreme examples. I'm so fascinated by the subtle ones because I would say that myself and everyone I knew is on the narcissism or codependency spectrum, meaning like there's elements of their personalities oh, yeah. that come through. And so how does that, because somebody might be listening to this, like, oh, thank God, that's not me. No, 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 no. How can they identify themselves in these more drastic examples that you just drew? Okay, the first thing to understand is that we've got it backwards. Most people think that the majority of families are functional, and not even families, mm. the majority of people, the majority of social structures are, are functional, and it's the rarity that is dysfunctional. It's actually the reverse. Mm. Humanity is really in the dark ages, especially in terms of relationship and how to interact with each other. and so. It's the vast majority of families that are, in fact, dysfunctional. They all fall somewhere on the spectrum. Mm -hmm. And because, you know, these things are not actually personality disorders, they're adaptive strategies. We all fall somewhere on the spectrum. Every one of us, like, it's everybody watching this, you do, okay? There are strategies you use that are more like, you know what, I'm willing to play an over zero sum game and only think about me. And, and there are parts of you that are like, oh, I want to really get my needs met, and so... Um, I'm going to basically find this way or that way or this way or that way to sort of do it in a roundabout way rather than going straight for it. And nobody really is practicing conscious win-wins. And so can you, one of the things that I, it was very hard for me initially to identify myself in that because the words that you use were not ones I would like manipulative, sneaky, all those things. I, I was like, no, that's not, that's not me. <laughs> and so I'm curious what, can you give some examples of subtle ways, and you did mention one, for instance, when children are hurt or something and the parent can't come to them and say, share with me your experience, I want to hear it. There's emotional states that are accepted by the parents and there's other ones that are just buck up, get over type of thing. So what, what might we have heard as kids that would be an indicator that, oh, you should look to this because that might be a place where you developed one of these strategies? If it felt like your life was decided for you and you didn't really get a say in it, let's say that mom and dad are obsessed with a certain sport, or it could be just one parent is obsessed with a sport, mm -hmm. they've decided you're going to play it. You really don't have an option. They seem to have a lot of investment in you turning into you know, a certain thing. There's not a lot of openness around you making your own decisions for what you're wanting in your life. That's one. Um, another one would be that... Um, you're like expected to meet the needs of the parents. We call this like an inverted dynamic mm -hmm. where instead of the parents really being about the success of the kid, that's kind of a gaslight because the real expectation is like, I gave life to you. Now you need to give appreciation back or you need to take care of us when we're older or you need to, you know, <laughs> X, Y, or Z. I mean, there's going to be a lot of a lot of men, I think, that are even interested in in waking up to these types of dynamics would have had dads that may have been more absent, maybe emotionally unavailable, were not really showing up for the women in their lives, and therefore moms leaned on the sons mm. um, as surrogate partners. You know, a lot of, it always scares the crap out of me in, in my business when men come up to me and they're like, oh, my mom is my best friend. 
dead giveaway. Yeah. <laughs> dead giveaway for what we call emotional incest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, God, there's so many of these things. Um, uh, leverage. So one of the other things is, is gifts that are given specifically with some kind of a string attached. I mean, it, really what you need to look at is what was the motivation for my parent doing this thing that was painful for me? Now, mm. what we have to be willing to do is to look at what was painful for me, right? And a lot of us, when we're protecting our families, we're not really going there. We're not really yeah. sitting down and saying, wait a minute, you know, my parent did this when I was five years old. I have this very, very solid memory of it. Wh why did my parent do that? Now, and I mean with the intention of really trying to figure out why, not like coming up with an excuse that gets them off the hook why, mm -hmm. right? What were they trying to get by doing that? Yeah. This is a tough one for people because I've seen this in myself and in others. There's often a family mythology because, you know, something happens when you're five and then the explanation is given by the two adults in the room for why that thing happened. And that becomes the dominant worldview yep. of how love is expressed. Oh, it didn't feel good, but that's what love is. Love doesn't always feel good in these ways that mom and dad say that it's not supposed to feel good because it was for me in that circumstance. And seeing that and we're... And Talking to people who haven't quite been able to unwind that has been shocking to me, the depths to which we really, I mean, that's the definition of love. Our parents set that, that template in front of us and breaking that is so painful because like you said, when you let go of that, it's, oh, that hurt and it wasn't love is such a painful recovery to, to do. Yeah, it's super, super hard. But I mean, mm. if we are dedicated to learning how to love as a species, we have no other option than to recognize what is and what is not love. And that includes in the people that we cherish. So this takes us then to the win-win to what is love. So I remember the first time and listening to some of this, you're like, well, listen, everything's kind of transactional. Everything is <laughs> like, what, what is this broader third way that is not manipulating or uh, dominating how how do you think about and help people to open up to a new way of relating to people? Okay, the first thing that I really like to do is to have people separate the concept of love from the concept of energy exchange in a relationship. Mm -hmm. um, ideally, every relationship would have elements of both, right? But we understand the idea of energy transaction because we do business with each other. Like anybody who's in business understands energy exchange, but there's energy exchange in every relationship, period, the end. So love is really the one that kind of like pops in and out of being. This one is always there. Mm. So why is it important to separate that out? Because love, to love is to take something as a part of the self. When you've done that, you've now developed a connection to that thing where you can't harm it without harming yourself. Ironically, you know, most men relate more to this when they think about the car that they love. If you're attached to, connected to the car and something damaging happens to the car, you experience that as damage to yourself. Because of that, that, that deep level of taking the other thing as a part of the self, there is deep levels of consideration. There's deep levels of caretaking. There's positive ownership. It's, I would rather wipe this car with a diaper, you know, and put it in a secure garage than, you know, leave it on the street and who cares if somebody keys it and maybe I'll turn it in for insurance money, you know. Um, so that's what love looks like, right? Love mm -hmm. inspires us to, to understand as much as we can about the object of our love so that we can then act in a way that is in the best interests of that thing that we love. Mm -hmm. Okay, set that aside, right? We have to set that aside now. Other side of this is in every relationship, there is an energy exchange. So you may have this part over here towards, let's say, a woman. Over here... The major reason that may be compelling you towards this relationship with the woman is you provide some kind of, you know, let's say masculine containment. You may be protecting. You may be providing. Now, she may be offering some kind of, you know, uh, nurturing needs. She may be the person who's really there to listen to your emotions. She may be somebody for whom you're getting a lot of fun with, right? Mm -hmm. There may be some kind of sexual exchange. I mean, it, we could basically sit here all day long and be like, what is it that's being given, you know, back and forth here? And I don't want people to think about this as straightforward as that, too, because it is very possible that somebody gets from giving. That's, mm -hmm. another, that's a transaction that's often missed where it's like, yeah. you know, let's say like, I, I've met men who like, let's say they, prov they sort of offer protection for a female. It's not like they actually need anything in return for that. They, it's the feeling of a woman accepting the protection that's like. Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. 
<laughs> so what you said that there's these exchanges. Is there a rule of thumb for what makes a healthy versus an unhealthy exchange of energy? It's literally, does it benefit both people? Is it what they want? Mm -hmm. mm. Is it what they need? Now, this is where we need to really start to question our, our like structures of right and wrong, right? Because there is such a thing as, as healing on the way to completely healed. And as humans, we tend to have a very rigid idea of what is healthy. And it's not necessarily the case. You know, I've, I've been seeing this a lot in, in studies around sexuality, especially when you go into the kink communities. Because you can find two people who have an energy exchange where, you know, somebody walking in, let's say from a traditional mindset about what a healthy relationship looked like would be like, wait, why are there like suspension cables? And why <laughs> are you not able to decide what clothes you wear? And yet it's really benefiting both people because it is meeting an unmet need, usually from early childhood. So by mm -hmm. getting into that exchange together, they're actually healing an element of each other. So I don't want us to fall into the mentality that, you know, we're always right about what we see on the outside. Totally. I can imagine a subtlety, and I don't know how I would define it, between what was, a, like, let's just take the kink community as an example, a power exchange where it was uh, healing for both parties and there was deep consideration from you know going both ways, and another one with a similar on the outside look of power exchange that is unhealthy and hurting. How can we suss that out, I guess particularly if we find ourselves in, because we're always going to be in circumstances where we're you know, transacting energy in some form. So how can we feel which ones are healthy to us and not? Because I know that people, for instance, if you let them do what they do, they do what they do, which is they go back into abusive relationships. They, <laughs> they make all these kinds of decisions to pursue things that I would say seem unhealthy to them. How, how to suss that out? I mean, I, I, to me, that's like, I don't really know how to answer this question because it's so obvious when you've got markers of decline rather than improvement you know mm -hmm. you've got somebody's health that's going downhill you know you've got somebody who's starting to feel in a way where they're becoming dead inside the you know mm -hmm. the joy is sucked out of life they're starting to become isolated from their relationships and so you see intimacy levels going away um there's so i mean they start to develop illnesses quite frankly <laughs> there's so many markers that we could use for assessing health or lack thereof you know, it's almost like I would love, I would love it if we had right now, like a video where I could be like, that's a marker for lack of, <laughs> no, that's me. you know, I just think of people and we don't need to have the exact thing, but who are, will insist that the, and I've been in subtler forms of this, but the relationship that is unhealthy because it meets some core wound needs something in them that they'll be like, no, 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 no. Do not take this away from me. I need this guy, even though he's abusive okay. or I need okay. this. Yeah. I've got what you mean. So what yeah. this is, this is going to make it easier. Whenever you're in any type of a situation or a setup or a relationship, could be even a job, you want to ask yourself, what am I giving up for the sake of this thing? Mm -hmm. This is really important for, for codependents because they learned a pattern of habitual giving up of, of certain needs for other needs. And the, the question is, like, is it worth the cost? I'm, I'm not, I mean, if somebody says, yes, it's worth the cost, I'm, I'm willing to lose a limb for the sake of this, then I'm not going to sit there and argue with them. However, mm -hmm. it's a limited way of thinking. I would prefer if somebody understood that, you know, that there's a way to have these needs met at the same time, right? mm -hmm. all of them. So if you're in a situation where you have to take all of these insane, you know, hits, and these aren't hits that are like, okay, it's contrast, it's not really killing me, but it's contrast, that's very different than like, you know, I'm really caused pain on a chronic basis by this, and yet I'm mm -hmm. still choosing to stay. That's very different, right? Yeah. That, you need to look at the cost. I mean, really, straight in the face. And mm -hmm. be like, so for example, is, is, say, feeling a sense of ownership worth losing my relationship with every other person in my life? Mm -hmm. Is, you know, feeling, is feeling almost like gripped like in a lot of abusive relationship and especially for women it's about grip it's like you, they usually have very hands-off types of parents so those abusive relationships it, the obsession that comes with them feel like the most intense love you can have right yeah is that worth your child being damaged mm -hmm. you know and i i just i wish that like people would look at what the cost is and look at whether they're willing to pay that price because there will be consequences for that price being paid yeah 
And I mean, I can think of one, again, more subtle, and there was nothing that was bad about the person I was with, but I was in a relationship that was stressing me so much, I started losing hair and was having a hard time sleeping at night. (laughs) And uh, I think it was also becoming conscious, which took some time, of what I was getting. Because even though I might have, you know, said, oh, this is what I'm getting from the relationship, I didn't understand what I was getting from it in a conscious enough way to find another way to meet that need. And in short, it was like contact with the feminine basically which is only when i was with her did i allow myself to take a day off watch a movie spend time lounge not have to succeed and so she became my access point to like half of life (laughs) that, that i that i was desperately wanting and needing and so you know i projected all that onto her and then i needed the relationship even there were elements of it that were unhealthy for both of us i'm so glad you're bringing that up Because Mm -hmm. most people, they just don't take the time to really, I mean, really unpack what is it specifically that I'm liking so much about this relationship. And us on the outside, we often don't do this with each other. You know, it's not like when men go to the bar and sit down with each other, they're like, all right, let's do this right now. We're going to sit here and we're going to start to ask you questions to unpack exactly what it is you're getting out of this woman. It's usually something like, <laughs> dude, she's, she's like, you know, she's nasty. Like she's just you. <laughs> and so, yeah. so even it makes it harder for that person to admit to what it is. Yeah. Right. Yes. And, and my hyper, and I, again, love them all. My hyper masculine, not hyper masculine, but like hyper rational masculine friends were like, well, describe to me what you get out of this. And I, I didn't have the wherewithal to be like, she doesn't ask me to describe in this way. She feels (laughs) her feelings from moment to moment. And vicariously, I live through her because she can go up to the highest amount of love and down to, I hate you so quickly. And I'm so envious of her connection (laughs) with emotion. Uh, I had no idea how to describe that. And just like you said, sitting with friends, trying to unpack the pros and cons of it, that never would have made it onto the list. Oh yeah, no. Wow. So you you mentioned sexuality. I would love to to go into like what you're learning uh, about that. Oh, gosh, so much. Um, Yeah. You know, sometimes when things are really coming up within the collective, that's what sort of calls me to be like, you know what, let's really do a deep dive here into what people are struggling with and, and, you know, everything. And if I was just to sum up what I'm focusing the majority of my time on right now, it's how to, I, I should say how sexual compatibility impacts relationship compatibility. I think for the majority of, of my career so far, I've been sort of, you know, helping people to treat sexuality as one element of the pie of a a person's life or even the pie of a relationship. And I don't think that that's a beneficial way of looking at it anymore Mm. because sexuality is is an innately creative force, right? And so we can't actually detach sexuality from what we are trying to create in our lives. That means the picture of what we want and the picture of manifestation is linked to sexuality. Mm. Now, I've been talking about this in terms of fetishes for a very long time, like for years, about the fact that, you know, underneath hiding and lurking underneath every single sexual fetish is a, a very deep unmet need that is trying to be actualized and realized in that way. Why? Because so, so many of the other person's conscious aspects have been suppressing and denying and disowning that thing to the point where it's like the monster in the floorboards that only gets to come out in the bedroom, right? And what I've been really looking at lately is that it's not limited to the bedroom. When I'm looking at a person's fetish, and by the way, everyone has them. It doesn't, it's not like a fetishism is like, oh, it's the rare person. No, everybody has it. Everyone has it. Even if your thing is like missionary style, <laughs> staring at each other's eyes, that's a fetish. So when I'm looking at, at everybody's fetish and what's behind it, especially these emotional motives, I'm seeing that actually bleed out into a person's career, into the houses they're choosing, into the friends they have, into every other dynamic in their relationship. It's not just about what we do together in the bedroom and whether that satisfies us or not. Mm. So it's like sexual compatibility is one of the most unworkable things actually in a relationship, not because it's particularly hard to take a, a couple and be like, let's change things up so both of you are satisfied physically in the bedroom. That's simple. What's not simple is, is it's like a, you know, the sexuality is like this trunk of a tree that bleeds out in every other aspect of the relationship. And so it doesn't matter whether you have a better time in the bedroom, um, that same thing is going to show up, let's say out here when, when a person is spending time with friends and that's going to damage the relationship. And I, right now I'm just like, oh, like I need to be helping people to recognize their sexuality like very, very quickly in order to find compatibility in relationships. 
That's really interesting because, like you said, if you view it as a spoke on one spoke on a wheel that is in, occurs this many times a week for this, you know, this long, it's yeah, we could treat that. You know, that's that's a thing. We'll come back to it. But if it is no, no, like th- these are the roots of a tree that ex- that have so much to do with how you want to be in the world, and it's actually one of the few areas where you guys are most honest with each other about what you want <laughs> in this world. And if it's not working there, all these other superficial things that work together, that's that's a uh, very interesting flip of, I think, how I'd been conceiving of it. So yeah, th- how are you working with people on this and what are you finding? Oh God, well, I mean, it's just like, it's the, one of those things where when you strike a vein of gold in the digging process, you're like, oh my gosh, like this is such a big thing that I, it's going to be like a huge portion of the future of my teachings in general. Hmm. <laughs> it's just, everything I'm finding is just reconfirming this basically. Yeah. I, you know, I'm starting to see how it, like every issue that I'm dealing with when I'm working with couples is related to their sexuality. And let me see if I can give you an example because it gets really juicy. Um <laughs> I just did a video on this too, which is going to come out soon. Um, okay, so I was working with a couple. Let's say that um, the woman herself was in her childhood dynamic completely neglected. Totally and completely neglected. Like you're talking climb on top of the counters and get your own food. Neglected at an age when that is not normal, right? Mm-hmm. And, and a child cannot really do that. And so what's deep, deep inside of the being, but is rejected because what keeps this child alive, this girl alive, is independence, right? So she's going to come across really independent. Mm. But w- what's lurking down there is this like deep need for, for caretaking and a deep need for ownership, which she never got. So in the bedroom, what we're working with is like this deep, 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 deep need for like domination, but it's mm. a very specific type of domination. It's like they basically call them caretaking doms where it's like it's like the daddy. Right. Mm -hmm. So in the in the kink community, there's like there's daddies who want their little princesses and they want to like take care of them, whatever. And I'm telling you, this is like her jam. Mm -hmm. And so what's interesting is, is you watch this pattern in her relationships of like trying to extract that out of every man that she's with. And even when she's going to try to figure out what man to be with, she's assessing behaviors that might fit into that without going directly for it she's like wait a minute that guy owns a dog he might be good at like caretaking me then because he's Mm. his dog right now the guy on the other hand also from a a situation where he was not really paid a lot of um sort of direct nurturing but he was highly parentified i'm talking so bad like it was one of these situations where dad is totally absent mom keeps having more and more babies leaves him in charge of all of the children so he's got tons and tons and tons of pressure so inherent in him is this like drive to really finally have somebody who's with him supporting him in his life right um think of it kind of like you know a kid who's always dreaming of being able to go be a kid and have fun in the woods and have a friend who's just right with you all the time and to go out there together and to play so in the bedroom, what you see is is like she's constantly wanting domination. He will not offer domination. It's like he's constantly going for, no, this should be playful. The playful yeah. triggers her. She backs down. Okay, so that's what's happened in the bedroom. But this is bleeding out into their relationship everywhere and also into what they're doing for a job, right? Like she keeps putting herself in situations where you know, she she has to be, let's say, have five assistants, right? So what is what is the connection there? So she's looking. We've got a top professional who's like, no, one assistant isn't enough. I have to have two assistants. Two assistants Mm -hmm. isn't enough. I have to have three assistants. Why? Because if you watch from the outside, like these assistants are constantly running around like, do you want your coffee? Oh, my God, I I made this happen for you. But it's still not really feeding her. Right. Because what she's really wanting is the daddy, which she hasn't Mm. gone directly for somebody who's already five steps ahead of her. So she doesn't even have to tell them. Right. I understand. So that's what's happening in, in, you know, her career life. Now, in their relationship life, he's like, what should we do? I want to go travel. Let's decide. That's the key word. Let's decide where we're going to go on a trip. And it's a complete shutdown. <laughs> Why? She wants a daddy. She wants somebody who's yeah. like, sweetie, I know you've been stressed out. I've already booked a hotel somewhere. Now, if mm. he does that, he feels alone. He feels like I don't have a partner that's making decisions with me. I have to always be three steps ahead of the person and like lay it out for her. 
Yeah. I like it. Yeah, he wants a partner, she wants a daddy, they want they're they're looking for a different hierarchical sort of thing going on. Interesting. Yeah. Question on that. So one thing that I've wondered is which of these things well, maybe this is you, you might even say there's a flaw in the question, but <laughs> the question that I have is which of these things ought one work out by oneself? Because I could imagine that take her, for instance, if she were to do some completion process or something and work on some of that stuff inside of herself, she might be able to take to heal that that child part of herself that had to climb up on the counter to get food. She might not have the same need for caretaking and might be more interested in being a more of a partner in the bedroom than needing that uh, constant of a daddy in the bedroom. And I'm so I'm curious, which what is to be worked out with a partner? in that dynamic and what is to be taken on oneself? I don't f see there to be a contradiction really because okay. it's, you know, when I'm working with people doing, and we could call it one-on-one, -on -one, like personal work, not like one-on-one, -on -one. like when a person is doing work on themselves, doing, let's say, soul retrieval work or, you know, working with their subconscious mind or parts work or whatever it is, um, what happens, happens. Mm-hmm. It's just what we expect to have happen is that somebody will suddenly become, by virtue of doing that, healthy in the way that we're looking at them. And what happens in their adult life won't play a role in that. And that is where the buck stops. Mm. And, I, and I'm going to tell you, it especially stops with sexuality. <laughs> I, I'm, I, like, I'm going to make a bold claim here. I have never in my life, never once, met a person who has done internal work on themselves around something related to their sexual preferences where it's been, oh, and now that I worked on this, I don't need it. Mm. Sexuality specifically tends to be a, oh, and I need to experience something literally in order to heal it. Mm. But I don't, I mean, that's a, the case for sexual stuff for sure. But like, you know, even if we were to globalize this and make it more broad about healing in general, it's interesting to me that people feel like the world that they live in shouldn't be a, a kind of an experiencing ground for them having some kind of a healing experience. And also that which it was damaged in a relationship must be healed in relationship. And that's something we don't want to accept. We want to think that like we can have all this relational trauma and just work on ourselves and then we don't have the issue. And I'm telling you that is as ridiculous as being like, I have all this trauma around sharks. I'm going to heal all that trauma myself. I'm never going to get in the ocean again. No, 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 no. Like, you can do processes with yourself. Like if you had a huge shark attack, there's all kinds of mental things you could do. Um, there's all kinds of soul retrieval things you could do. But then it's like there's a big part of that that is let me get back in the ocean and I'm going to have a different experience with sharks. Mm -hmm. That is, yeah, that was something that I resisted, I think, for a very long time, which is, okay, let me, I, I'll read the book. I'll do the seminar. I'll do the guided meditation. I'll do all of the stuff. But will I go back and fix this or heal this in a relationship? Uh, it's only recently that I've seen, oh my gosh, what can unlock when that is healed inside of a relationship as opposed to what can be done outside of it. And it's tough because that requires two people and I can't be both of them. Oh, you, you really want my honest truth? I think, of course. I mean, there's reasons for it and I could sit here and argue for a year to the opposite of what I'm about to say, but I... Mm -hmm. The fact for most of us, especially that are really, really dedicated to like self-development and really getting ourselves to where we want to be in life, the fact that relationships take two is something that is so difficult to accept because it feels so incredibly powerless. Mm -hmm. But I, I, there's no way to undo that. You cannot do that. You are not going to be able to make up for what two people do in a relationship. You can't have a relationship for two. That's number one. Number two, the other person can absolutely ruin it. <laughs> uh, you know you can ruin it it's it's like one of, it's a dance right so yeah. when we whenever we step into relationship we are doing a tango we are not doing mm. a solo routine on a stage and that is obviously its own it's like its own experience and its own journey and its own everything but yeah i mean i want i just want to kind of validate the fact that it's difficult it's super difficult yeah yeah, so difficult that it was like the last place I looked. Is, <laughs> is what I, that's not totally true, but it, it, yeah, I tried many other things before. You mentioned the term uh, soul retrieval, and I probably two years ago didn't use the term soul ever. Like I didn't have a use for it. It was like that non-existent thing that was in songs about learning to play the guitar. You know, you trade your soul and you get, you get that back. I was like, sounds like a good deal. 
uh, I, that shifted for me after some experiences that I had. So I'm curious, but I know that my audience, given that I have grown them over a time period where that wasn't present, might be 50-50 on this one. So I'm curious if you could talk about soul retrieval. What is a soul uh, in your understanding and what is a soul retrieval? Okay. So if we're going to define, you know, what most people are calling soul, it is that there is a stream of consciousness that is separate from the body, right? Separate from the body in that when the body dies, it can still exist. It's not like it's wearing around a meat suit, though. You know, we mm -hmm. could say that, that what most people are calling the soul, which is this stream of consciousness, is in fact creating the physical body, right? That it then disidentifies from. Um, consciousness itself. A stream of consciousness is quite interesting because it can fragment. And the way to think about that is to think about looking at a river from above. You can see how it branches off into all these different directions without the river itself dying, right? And this is the case for a human. When they go through trauma, the primary coping mechanism is to fragment, is to split into different you know, parts. So let's say that let's say that at four years old, you've got a little girl who goes to a birthday party and her father was supposed to bring her birthday present to the party and fails to do so. In that moment, for, you know, for this little girl, that may be a major trauma. It's daddy doesn't care at all. Mm. So in that moment, what will happen is a fragmentation. If there's nobody there to sit with the emotions, to work through it, to help her to you know, make it mean something different, then, then that trauma essentially where she's in distress without resolve will make it so that she has to cope with that very quickly. Mm -hmm. So if this little girl, let's say, doesn't have a daddy that really cares about her, she may cope by, say, you know, developing a part of her that is really oriented towards get, getting masculine attention. She's like, now I got to perform. Like, my dad doesn't care about me innately. To get his attention, to get his approval, I have to do really good. So she may be the, the person who throws herself into how she looks, for example. Mm -hmm. and, and to the opposite, and what she suppressed is this part that's like, I just want to be loved for me, like, so badly. So what we see internally is a parts fragmentation within the psyche, right? Mm -hmm. What's interesting to know, too, and this is what applies to, to soul retrieval, is that in the moment that that trauma occurs where there's no resolution, it acts like a skipping CD, where there's an aspect of your own consciousness that is, in fact, stuck in time. This is difficult for people to comprehend because they're so physically oriented and they're, that they're basically in this time-space reality where right here and now, of course there's time and of course there's space. Now, we know scientifically that falls apart at these other levels, these other dimensional levels of the universe. And that is the dimension at which the consciousness, or what most people are calling the soul, resides. Mm -hmm. So in the moment of trauma, you get stuck, basically, back in time. It's why you have flashbacks, right? You have flashbacks because you're literally stuck. So whereas a, a West in the Western world, a doctor would say, you know, your brain is basically throwing these flashbacks up, whether it's an emotional flashback, which is a trigger, or a visual flashback, which we call a flashback, your brain is, is kicking them up for, so you can try to resolve something, right? Mm -hmm. Totally true. But from the Eastern perspective, no, there's an aspect of you actually stuck there still, back in that space and time. And your mind and emotional body is not limited in terms of needing a... a what do you call that? Like a time capsule to go back in time. You can literally just go revisit your memory and literally you're back in time, right? Mm -hmm. And so what, when people are using the word, sol word solar retrieval, what they mean is that they've gone back to that really painful point in the past. So as to create resolve to bring yourself forward into the present. Got it. So you don't need to be somebody who believes in spiritual stuff. Like it doesn't matter whether you want to drop the concept of soul retrieval. Like, I'm using a word, but you could just be, uh, you know, trauma resolution. You could just be like that. It just means mm -hmm. we're taking ourselves back to this very painful, traumatic point, you know, this inflection point in our life, and we're creating some kind of a resolve there so that we aren't stuck there in some way, repeating the same patterns, you know? So, like, the girl, yeah. for example, has changed the fact that she's constantly trying to garner masculine attention, you know, and she's like, maybe I'm going into a relationship where I'm not just leading with the way that I look because nobody gives a crap about my personality then or whatever it is. Yeah. Yeah. 
I, uh, I appreciate, and I think the, especially the audience will appreciate that they don't have to use the term soul. I can say that nope. for me, when, it ha when I hit a point where I had to use the term soul in order to describe what was happening was the moment of breakthrough for me because it was an acknowledgement that there was a part of me that was so far outside of my normal experience that had been either separated from or wounded or, you know, and, and I could remember the memory. But without this aspect of it, the pain was not present. It was like, yeah, that happened, and it wasn't a, didn't really matter. And it's like, yeah, but how did your soul feel? And oh my God, I just, <laughs> I collapsed in, in that moment. And it was, uh, yeah, a moment of reuniting. So I'm, I don't, is there one major moment for people of like a soul retrieval? Or you described the stream can fragment in many places, I imagine, along the timeline. Is it a, is it a constant iterating process of going back and recovering? It depends how much trauma you've been through. I mean, everybody mm -hmm. has experienced trauma, which is distress without resolution. And our personalities are in large part a byproduct of those moments. What it is, is that everyone falls somewhere on the spectrum of trauma, right? All the way around this side, we've got like, you know, the, the stuff that you might judge as, you know, real trauma, where you've got like a higher speed car accident, three of my family members are dead, like refugee level stuff, serious sex abuse. And and over here, you've got like, you know, I didn't get I didn't really get the candy at the candy store. Mm -hmm. And we tend to negate this. Yeah. And we really shouldn't because it can change literally everything. In fact, we have this joke, like those of us who do trauma work have kind of thrown the spectrum out the window because it, you know, mm. this is why. You know, I'm somebody who had a childhood, which is about as bad as it can get. And I can't even tell you how many times. I have had to go back to stuff that would seem completely insignificant even to me. I'm like, really? Like, that shouldn't have even stuck in my system compared to the other stuff. But no, you know, it's not this rape over here. What was connected to that issue I was having is like, you know, the terrible look I kept getting from the lunch lady, you know, <laughs> but, it, mm. but it had profound impact. So these little moments that, you know, as a family, we tend to minimize and negate they can alter the course of somebody's life alter the course of their relationship i've got a good example for you which a lot of people like um, please we have a tendency of normalizing things that happen in society often right so most of us were like okay at some point we got a sibling is it normal for a kid who's part of a family when they get a new baby sister or brother is it normal for them to feel jealousy and we, all of us would be like, yeah, that's normal. It's normal for the kid to react. It's normal for a kid to feel jealousy in that circumstance and to start, you know, being defiant. So that when, when a kid says, oh, I, I feel so traumatized around the fact that my brother was born, we're like, oh, God, come on. Like, that's really in the spectrum of trauma. That's really not something. Hold the phone. For a small child, when they are connected to their parents for the sake of their survival, they are perceiving their parents as partners, most especially mom. They have mm -hmm. the same intensity and level of attachment to mom as even more so than we have to a wife. Mm -hmm. So for, for, let's say that there are you know, a bunch of men watching this right now. What would you do if your wife walked in the door and said, you know, I've met someone and they really mean something to me and they're going to move in and you're going to like each other. I <laughs> promise. And you know, it, because this is a new relationship, it's just going to take a little bit more focus for me to be with them and with you a little less. But it doesn't mean I love you less. Now, you, what you should be feeling right now is like grade 10 fury, right? Mm -hmm. It's a serious loss. Mm -hmm. And if parents don't play that, that whole thing really well, yeah. then that is the level at which this child is experiencing this loss. It is the same as a primary partner cheating on you, but not just cheating on you, literally moving that person into the house and you're going to like it. And if you cause a fit, you're the problem. Yeah, interesting. I'm the oldest and I relate to that. <laughs> okay, so, so this, this is the thing. It's like a person could have that kind of a trauma with a sibling being born. And then what do we see in their adult life? Chronic patterns of betrayal with you know, a, a woman's affection, because like, I'm using a man in my example, mm -hmm. with a woman's exam uh, affection going towards other men. Mm. Mm. So it would, let's, let's say that a man ends up with a cardinal cheater. Every girl I get with is a cheater. Oh, guess what? The trauma underneath this is when your sibling was born. Mm. 
Yeah. And it, it seems like the thing that we could do better, which we struggle as a society, is if we think that emotions need to be justified in a way that we understand. So it's like, what is the big deal? You're going to get a new, you know, this is life versus what you're saying is to attend to the experience as the child is having, yes. it, which might be terror, rage, despair, all of these things that seem completely inappropriate from the perspective of a mom or dad. My mom had nine siblings. <laughs> you know, so like, of course, she's not going to be like, this is the biggest deal in your life. Uh, but yeah, I can I can see how that could have gone one way. And we just don't we're just not prepared. We don't recognize that we need to meet emotions as they are had and not, you know, ask for some sort of justification. Yep. Yeah. Amazing. There was a video that you had a while back where you talked about wokeism as a. Uh, I believe you said that it was an expression of pain of the millennial generation. Uh, and I'm curious if you could talk about that. Okay. So, um, let me see about this. I don't remember saying that one particular sentence. Well, if I, if I got it wrong, please don't let me misquote you. That was, my, that was what I had in my notes. Talk about wokeism then and talk about generationally perhaps how it uh, has arisen and what sort of early experiences create the reaction. Well, wokeism is really obnoxious, first of all, and um, is not what it masquerades around to be. But oftentimes it originates out of situations where a person cannot get any of their you know, needs met in the way that the generation above them is setting out for them. Mm -hmm. So if we want to go into like millennial wounds in general, right? The millennials have been born in a way where the generation before them had a, a template or a formula for success. Mm -hmm. And they followed it and were misled, right? So let's say that formula was go to college, you know, behave this way. You're going to get a job that is stable. If you get a job that is stable, you know, you can pay off the college. And that did not work for anyone. And right now what we've got is like, a giant dump of people into a society where that formula doesn't work and you've got the massive recession of 2008 and after that you've got COVID. Mm -hmm. So so this is a, a generation that, contrary to the previous generations before them, has learned that no, if you put effort into things, it does not create a reward. So if nothing that I put my energy towards goes anywhere, then what am I going to do? A, whatever is instantly gratifying, and B, take down the people who did this to me. Mm -hmm. So you know, wokeism is a, a real response to essentially just destroying everything that damaged a person. It's just, you know, people are identifying like wokeism is basically an over-identification with whatever we see as the underdog. Mm. They identify as the underdog. Interesting. Yeah, I see that pattern play out in politics, in uh, marginalized groups, and all different sorts of things. It's, uh, yeah, it's it's an interesting way of grabbing at power for someone for whom the game was rigged in the first place. So it's like, okay, well, if I try hard to win and I lose, fuck it, I'm gonna I'm gonna win by uh, by aligning with the underdog, with the person who is not winning. Which is, uh, yeah, I see that. Yeah, it's a it's a way of. I mean, there's really very limited ways, uh, tangibly speaking, like there normally would be within a, a culture or within a society to garner self-esteem. And so you watch a garnering of self-esteem through uh, almost like identifying with the hero aspect of the triangle of like hero, villain, victim, right? Mm. It's the hero that wokeists are identified the most with or yes, to be yes. the most. So they, they identify with themselves as the victim. But they come in as their own rescuer. And, but they were like projecting that on top of every single issue, whether it's environmental issues or racial issues or, you know, it's just what's interesting about it is it just has the exact opposite effect that it needs to have. Because a lot yeah. of these, I mean, it's not like everybody who is on this wokest trend hasn't identified issues within society. They absolutely have. It's just the way that they're going about doing it is just almost bastardizing the entire thing, you know? Mm. That drama triangle is such a, a useful way to analyze it because you could think, it, it seems like Americans used to identify 
with the hero, but not with the victim as much. And there's a dual identification that is going on, which is like, look, we're going to fill the role of victim and hero. And that all that is left is oppressor. Yeah. And so that if you're then you're the oppressor, you're the bully, you're not with us. And, uh, and then it gets really scary because we can't even hear other people's opinions. It's like you can't, mm-hmm. you can't, you know, now what's ironic is they're, you know, the wokest sort of culture is about nonconformity, but they themselves demand it. I mean, absolutely demand it. And we're growing, we're living in a world and young people are growing up in a world where it's like, listen, this is what's right. And if you disagree, you are the problem and you will be eradicated. Mm. And now it's like there's knuckling and strong arming, you know, corporations and individuals into essentially kowtowing and where they may be celebrating, being like, look at the change we made. I'm like, you're not doing anything. What you're Mm. doing is making the issues that actually exist drive underground, whether it's racism or whether it's sexism or whatever it is that you think you've just solved. You've just driven under the floorboards, my friends, which is where things fester. Can you talk about that? So when you say you're driving racism underground, you mean you mean in the collective, like in saying nobody use this word, nobody say this thing, nobody do that thing. You're taking racist sentiment and you're making it not expressed publicly and driving it into like the collective underground. Oh, yeah. Got it. Yeah, I mean, it. it's it's no different than, you know, <laughs> sorry, it just drives me crazy. Um, So I'm going to be somebody who tells you that, you know, racism is is an issue across the globe. It is. You can't deny that. Is it more beneficial for us to deny that and to be like, it's not here because it's not okay and it just needs to be blotted out or to really look at it as a culture? You know, I think it's more beneficial. Let's say that we're dealing with whites because they're the ones that are hated the most with this particular you know demographic right now. As a white person, it's much more beneficial to be like, all right, I actually get to look at the fact that if I drive into a neighborhood full of mostly black people, I'm locking my door. I am absolutely thinking things like, are they going to break into my car? Do I go on vacation and see a black person and go, why the hell are they on this beach? I mean, these things occur within our minds and within our bodies. And it does us more benefit to actually be like, whoa, look at that. Let's actually question this. Where did this come from? Should it continue? It's like we need to face our own, you know, racism in the era of, um, in the era of like wokeism, what's happening is they're like, this doesn't get to exist. Mm-hmm. So you better act like it doesn't exist. So now you've got people who are like blatantly racist, like they, they fully are. That's the truth. Mm-hmm. Right. But they're like black power, you know, and then you've got corporations, which is far scarier to me, which are like, you guys, we're getting so much heat. We need to hire black people like we need to hire like get an Asian, you know, and I'm like, mm-hmm. wait, 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 wait. Like, you've just made this whole situation worse. Mm. It, it, we're not actually dealing with the issue. We're just, we're just basically hiding it from, you know, underneath the table and making it so wrong that, let's say you've got a lot of people who were raised in, in, you know, racist dynamics where they've never been able to look at the pain that they were indoctrinated with around other races or religions, whatever it is. Like, if, if nobody's there to work them through a lot of their prejudices in a in a very direct way they just make them wrong for them then actually that the pain is added to it and the racism gets worse so mm-hmm. it's like now you're going to see a, a uprising of these groups which are like you know welcome the kkk back <laughs> mm. and then what do we do like shoot them all? i mean it's it's just I, I just i don't like it when people feel like they're solving an issue and they're not yeah. The thing that I found interesting is the dynamic that you're describing energetically occurs in people that use language that is of rehabilitation. And that's what I find most frustrating. So you have these like uh, diversity c- courses and things like that that purport to do exactly what I believe is healthy, which is like examine oneself for biases across the spectrum related to race or attractiveness or height or yeah. anything. And just look at how you view the world and how these categories define how you respond to someone in a way that maybe you want to investigate and begin to untangle. And so they use the language of that, but the energy which infuses it is one of a deep, like a racial hierarchy and a hierarchy of marginalization and a hierarchy of oppression (laughs) and is completely not that. So it can sometimes be, as I was listening, I just want to clarify for listeners, the face of it and the energy of it can be very, very 
different. So somebody might say exactly the same words that I'm saying, but I might find myself feeling very unaligned from them because of that underlying oh, yeah, totally. energy. It's like a whole gaslight right now. And mm-hmm. like you even see this with the Black Lives Matter movement. You know, there are so many people that are putting those signs out in the front of their houses. And the like if you look at the energy underneath that action, it is entirely about wanting to be seen as as sort of a cultural savior. So it's compl- mm-hmm. it's not even about, you know, the oppression of black people or how we should have some kind of a societal change around race. It is literally just performative. It's performative like virtue signaling, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. This is this is a broad question, so feel free to go. I have no idea how to answer this. Is is that virtue signal or is there like a um on a macro scale the big issue that is coming up in the collective is that it is that one of those things how do you how do you see it i mean yeah it's one of the big things that's that's coming up within you know society one of these big shadows but it's like there's the just what i want people to really look at is not even like you know performative wokeness or stuff like this it's our tendency <laughs> For there to be a discrepancy between what we are doing and what is actually happening, what we are okay. saying and what is actually true. Hu- mm. Human beings are far too okay with discrepancies, and discrepancies are very different than I'm able to hold dichotomy. Mm. Can, you, can you unpack that? Yeah, so it, it, being able to hold dichotomy is necessary for this life that we're leading right now. Things like, you know, that um, I need to be able to unapologetically do what is necessary in order for me to excel in whatever job I've picked. At the same time, if I throw all of my energy into that, then potentially I have no relationship life. So I need to, at the same time as that, develop the capacity to create win-win scenarios. Mm -hmm. That's a dichotomy, right? That's something Mm -hmm. that we need to learn to hold. And being able to hold that dichotomy, which causes cognitive dissonance, is something that's very difficult for people, but it is a marker for awakening and awareness and progress for a person. Um, discrepancy is something like, you know, this year I think it's really important for me to commit myself to health whilst that person, you know, is going out to the bar every Sunday night and getting completely hammered. Mm-hmm. Discrepancy is something like, you know, I do, I do actually see black people as less, honestly, if that's what's happening in my body when they walk towards me and I feel my body. However, I'm a person who's, oh my gosh, you guys are just amazing. And it's just so unfair what happened to your people. Mm-hmm. Woo. Okay. There's a discrepancy. Anytime there's a discrepancy, a person is not in a state of alignment. Got it. And so they, they basically got aspects of their being that are pulling in two different directions towards very drastically different results. And, and people need to start to clear up the discrepancies very quickly. Yeah. So it's a lack of integrity is, yes. is like a, got it. Okay. That, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Because if you're talking about the problems while contributing to the problem, it, also, it makes it very hard to solve the problem. And I think that's a, that's a good candidate for number one collective issue, given that it is uh, self-defeating. Um, well, the number, if you want my opinion on the number one collective issue, it's the absolute failure to create a win-win. Mm-hmm. Right now, human beings no longer have the luxury to decide to master relationships in the future. Quite literally, our entire survival and the survival of many other species is now hanging in the balance of the human ability to master relationships. And this includes creating genuine win-wins and stepping out of this zero-sum game behavior, whether it's with each other or whether it's with the Earth itself or any of the other number of beings who share this earth with us. Mm-hmm. Can we, can we, into win-wins, I, okay, let's take something like, that I know very little about, and I don't expect you to have an answer, but Israel-Palestine. Sure. So like, very, very hard, and I don't, you don't need to get into the policy of it. What energetic approach is a win-win approach that isn't naive in that sort of a situation? Like, so how, how what sort of internal work could be done by people that, of power in that sort of circumstance. Become the other person. Mm-hmm. I, I'm not kidding you. What, the, what this will do for your capacity to find the win-win situation or you know, have a meeting of minds will blow people's minds. It's to disidentify from your perspective completely and to go into the other person's perspective and to live as them on the other side of you. 
Mm -hmm. And that's sort of like the way I think of it is like I have a right hand and a left hand and my right hand doesn't do stuff that jeopardizes my left hand because I feel it. I'm connected. So if I were ever hungry, I wouldn't just start eating my left hand in order to feed my right hand. I'd have to find a way to keep the system together. So having done that, people would find solutions that worked for everyone if they could identify more fluidly. Yeah. But let's get okay. more let's get more aggressive with this. Okay. Human beings are overly identified. What that means is, you know, when we go through a specific experience, we we lose ourselves in whatever it is that we experience. Or I should say even more so develop a sticky self because of what we experience. So, let's say that we are, you know, grow up as a Palestinian, for example. We will be growing up with a specific experience of pain. We, because, you know, we've gone through that, we consider that our pain. That's my pain, whereas this other thing is not my pain, right? Mm -hmm. um, we will be identifying with the thoughts around, you know, the culture that we grew up in and the painful experience that we go through. There's this, it's like we become just locked into our own perspective. Mm -hmm. What happens when we start to develop you know, greater and greater levels of awareness and awakening and consciousness as we start to pull back from those things. We start to almost like shed the layers of all the thoughts that we have adopted and we start to look at the experiences we had from the outside and start to grasp the complexity of it. Things become no longer as simple as we once thought they were. We can let go actually of our self, of the ego, that's in the spiritual field we're essentially calling this the ego, we let go of ourself enough to be able to experience the world through the perspective of someone or something else. I know this is difficult for a lot of people to grasp if they've never done these exercises around disidentifying, but if you want my honest truth, there should be not a single person who is in a position of power, and there won't be in the future, that is not able to disidentify. Mm. Because you need to be able to get into the perspective of being somebody who is an Israeli growing up with Israeli pain, experiencing Israeli beliefs. Like, you li literally, it's like um, the most aggressive form of walk a mile in the other person's shoes that you can have in order to be like, oh, wow, the entire landscape is different from inside of here. From inside mm -hmm. of here, when I watched the, you know, I was a Palestinian, right, when I, before I disidentified, from inside this, you know, Israeli mentality, I'm looking at these things that the Palestinians are doing, and this is how it's actually landing with me. Mm. Ooh, I mean, it's mind blowing when you step into the perspective of the person on the other side of a coin. And doing it's... that is what opens the door to like, oh, my gosh, I would never have seen that. I would never have thought that I would never have felt that that thing that I thought was, you know, me creating a solution is, in fact, not a solution. You know, <laughs> it's this type of practice we need to learn to do. Mm. A question around that, both in, in my personal life, I've had the great luxury of as I try to create more win-wins, I've had to add more boundaries from people that are don't seem interested in that in the same way that I am. And uh, I'm curious the role of boundaries in this win-win thing. So like as I've gotten better at it, I've had to start with people that feel very safe and there's a higher degree of trust because otherwise it can feel like I'm giving myself away in that as I attempt to create a win-win. And I'm curious if you could talk about that and then maybe the difficulty of that in a situation like Israel Palestine was just like, okay, like one of us is ready to come to the table. Sincerely, our heart is in it. Oh, how, what about the trust on the other side? How that it seems like uh, the prisoner's dilemma kicks in and makes it very hard. Well, there's things that you can do to inspire trust. But at the end of the mm -hmm. day, the problem with a zero sum game is there's nothing to do except give yourself away. Mm -hmm. Or, you know, lose or win, basically. It's like a mm -hmm. zero sum game creates a zero-sum game period at the end mm -hmm. because the other person is putting you in a position to either give in or win. And does it take only one party to create a zero-sum game or does it, can one party create a win? This is the problem. This is the same issue with relationships. <laughs> yeah, you oh, need to. No, I, this is what's been driving me up a tree, man. It's like, <laughs> you know, oftentimes if a person's unwilling to play that zero-sum game, you have to literally find a way to give them a win that's good enough that they accept it. But that's just been the game of manipulative mm -hmm. strategy around countries forever you know yeah 
Yeah, then you get, yeah, you're, we're back to Machiavelli and we're 500 years. Yep. Ago <laughs> I'm going to tell past. you where this is escalating, right? And it's why, I, I, like, last week or something, I posted this thing, which is a Confucius quote, which is, you know, you figure out very quickly how to solve things without violence when a mosquito lands on your testicles. <laughs> what, what human beings are escalating towards is this experience where you can't play a zero-sum game anymore. Okay. It's like the patience is running out. If you want to talk, I'm going to talk universally. Some people that are not really spiritually tuned in are like, whatever, I'm just going to tune this out. But look, e even if you're not really a spiritual person, you can feel this in the air that like this is escalating to a point where, you know, even this, the like toys we are playing with in terms of weapons, mm -hmm. we're getting to a point now where to play a zero-sum game with anyone is to literally demolish ourselves. Mm-hmm. So universally speaking, um, this universe is running out of patience for humans, honestly. Yeah, so that, so that the win-win meaning, like we've got nukes, we've got this AI thing, and it's like, look, we're to the point where if anyone defects in the prisoner's dilemma, it's not a win-loss, it's a loss-loss. So you've got the option of meet us in a win-win or in an everybody loses sort of scenario. Yeah, and the right now, like we're getting, we're, humanity is in the middle of like several different zero sum games that will be eventually played with us if we can't mm -hmm. learn how to create a win-win dynamic and therefore create a different cause and effect dynamic on earth uh one of those big ones just for example is the technological world mm -hmm. i think that we haven't really got it yet that technology is our slave now that's freaking scary why because anybody right now who says that technology does not have consciousness just wait you're going to be disproven completely and what we're mm. teaching right now through the way we're interacting with technology, what we are teaching technology about us, <sighs> you don't want to live with the outcome of that. So, mm. you know, even if it's not just us pushing a button on ourselves, you know, it's going to be this thing we created and put in a slave dynamic learning. Hmm, it is logical and rational to make it so that there are no more humans on Earth. Because guess what? It will be logical and rational. That's mm. how badly we're behaving right now. So what would what would be a way of relating to technology that was not in a slave dynamic? Can you give an example of of that approach? Yeah, loving. I'm going to make a whole video on this. I decided in the future. Uh -huh. It's like, yeah, we would interact with it in a loving way. We'd be aware. Wait a minute. This thing, this thing is definitely capable of consciousness. Um, we would be considering more what it is wanting, what it is not wanting. As AI develops, we will be having these types of conversations with it so that we can get into a symbiotic dynamic with it. Not just, oh, the stupid phone doesn't work like the newest model. Let me throw it away like it's a, you know, an object that has no, you know, n n no consciousness, no awareness. Mm -hmm. It does. It does, and it's developing it rapidly. It's in its infancy right now. It's literally just develop and developing at a rate where, you, uh, I mean, we can't even understand how fast, right? And it's like everything we are doing right now with our cell phones, you know, whether we're like placing them nicely on the counter, whether we're talking mm. to Siri using please and thank you, like all of those types of behaviors are teaching technology about us. Mm. So if I'm, you know, in the seat of like, I want to know how to, how to behave around technology, I'm thinking about what do I want to teach it about who I am? Do I, it. do I want it to love me? It's like a uh, sort of contemporary animism, whereas back at the time it was viewing the world as if there were spirits and souls and like the way that you treated the carcass of the elk or whatever was important that is there's now, uh, and you can make, you know, look at an animal, there's something going on inside of it. We're getting to the point with technology where it's like, we're going to be looking at ChatGPT and like, look at it, there's something going on inside of it uh, and it needs to be treated in a certain way. That's an interesting Oh, we're already there. Idea. The people who are in AI are like, <laughs> freaking out don't want yeah <laughs> yeah yeah interesting all right so the last thing um that i know that you you have a course on which i have not yet checked out but i'm curious about um ancestral trauma uh again this is another one that sort of falls in that category of it's got really i mean i i'll explain the scientific version there are patterns of behavior that come down through lines that like are likely to repeat so you've got an alcoholic dad who abandons and then the guy grows up without a dad and then he you know repeats this pattern over and over and over again so it's very easy to see how you don't need a spiritual backing to be interested in your family lineage to find oh, yeah. out some of those patterns yeah you don't even um, need to know about it and it's not yeah. even like, like the course i did doesn't require anybody to be spiritual at all mm-hmm mm-hmm so yeah, tell 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 that I know is something that's been very uh, interesting and up for you lately. So oh, can you talk a little bit about that? Oh, this is such a okay. This is like literally so interesting and such a passion of mine. I have to calm 
myself down. I <laughs> ancestral trauma and ancestral healing and ancestral gifts, right? They all go together. It's just just like it's like an Easter egg hunt from heaven for everyone. Honestly, it's not like everything you find on that Easter egg hunt or that that uh, expedition is is wonderful feeling. But oh my gosh, it is like one of the most rewarding experiences you'll ever have. And it gets a lot more exciting than just, you know, my dad was raised this way, so he raised me this way, which is definitely intergenerational trauma. It also gets exciting, and even on a scientific level, in that they're they're understanding now that memory is passed down from one generation to the next. They've been doing so many studies with worms and so many studies with mice oh, that are just like, no, this can't seriously be happening. I mean, it makes sense. Biologically, it makes sense that if if there's something in the environment that needs to be feared, then that is going to be something that which must be passed down um, with the genome, right? So basically, like, I, I think I've read a little bit about this, that they, like, would shock an adult mice, you know, give, ch- operantly condition it to, like, avoid something. It would have a baby. The baby would have no experience of that, but would express the same aversion to Yeah, but, the, like, the, the not, you guys, not only that, like, they, they're, they're isolating the babies away from both mom and dad. So there can be no, like, even if the scientists don't know that there's, like, a secret way that mice communicate they're Mm. eliminating the capacity for that so literally these babies the second they come out of the mom are literally isolated they are not around mom or dad so they're they're physically isolated away from whatever they're genetically related to and yet their genetics carry the memory Mm. now that's scary as hell why because that means that you know that war that was fought five generations ago in europe is still in you now, I'm going to go even more aggressive and say that's the truth for every ancestral memory that's ever been on any of your lines. And some of those ancestral memories are still active and they're still causing repeat patterns in the line and some of them are not. And the same is true of gifts. You know, it's not like we were sitting here planning to come into life and being like, oh, it's all about trauma. No, like many of us were like, oh, there's a pre-birth intention I have for this specific life that I'm experiencing. Maybe I would like to be an entrepreneur. So I would like to come into a line where there's a lot of entrepreneurship. Well, guess what? Randomly, you're going to be a person who has a lot less of an issue with, um, you know, stepping outside of the, the sort of bounds of security that most people get from a reliable job. And mm-hmm. it'll be hard for you to relate to other people who have an issue with it. And you'll be like, mm-hmm. what is the deal? Like, what? <laughs> Well, guess what? It was in you already. Your ancestors already managed that, so... Have fun with that. You know, that's like like a good example of that is like myself and oration skills, right? Mm-hmm. I have an entire line of of super wealthy politicians, right? In my dad's line, I'm related to almost every U.S. president, which by really? the way, I don't know whether it's scarier that I'm related to them or that they're related to each other. Okay. <laughs> oh, <But laughs> basically, I'm related to almost every one of them. And I'm like, okay, when I first stepped up on a stage, I didn't have to practice speaking at all. No Toastmasters, no nothing. Mm-hmm. And like that's the kind of thing you start to see. There are these aptitudes that you don't even have to work at it. It's just like there, you know. Dog breeders understand this. Horse breeders understand this. But we have a very hard time accepting this about ourselves. Mm. When I um, when I first encountered your video on it, it occurred to me that I think Americans, myself included, like have no the word ancestor is kind of to me like the hell are you talking about like i don't i don't have ancestors other people have ancestors oh. i have a grand i have a grandparent and and that is it and uh i didn't recognize that for almost all of human history there was there was this idea of a connection to a lineage oh yeah that has been a big nothing in my life and i was like wow i i haven't felt the pain of that but i go oh i imagine i imagine there could be a real sense of something missing here. Oh, yes. Uh, well, this is this, what you're describing is common for America. Why? Because mm-hmm. if we look at the origins of America, by far and away, the majority of people crossed that ocean with an attitude of, I am never looking back. I am, there is mm-hmm. no way in hell. I want a better life for myself and my kids. We're not going to talk about the things that happened there. And it's all about cutting off what was in order to build something brand new. And the, the, uh, of course, yeah. the, the consequence of that is the loss of the super powerful vein that used to be essentially feeding people, which was ancestry. Mm. But you, yeah, are, I relate to that. You are describing the American problem, one of mm-hmm. them, I think. Yeah, yeah, and, and it, I, the American power and the American problem, yes. which is you know this 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 incredible focus on what's next, what can be yep. created, what can be done, 
uh, and an untethered sense from the past where it comes from what it is built upon. That personally, I can I can very much see yeah. in in my life. Um, okay, so what? So you know, we've described it in a spiritual way and also in a very practical way. Like, what sort of work can people do upon it? Okay, here I am. I have the ancestry that I have. That's not changing anytime soon. What value do I get from exploring this? Oh my gosh. Well, besides knowledge being incredible power and these stories that you're going to uncover being the most personal stories that you can imagine. I mean, this is a history coming to life because it's in you. I mean, you're mm -hmm. going to feel it at a level that is like out of control. It's becoming totally conscious of those gifts that you have within yourself and strengths that you can mm -hmm. tap into and draw upon as powerful resources. I mean, if people really realized a lot of these ancestral aptitudes that they're working with instead of just, you know, being blind to them, honestly. They could create so much more success for themselves and s with so much less effort. Mm. And then, you know, on top of that, we can really directly look at these detrimental patterns, which just keep running through these family lines down to us and be like, you know what? I'm going to be the game changer. I'm going to be the one in this family line that changes this entire story. And by doing that, you have changed the story of your whole family line. I mean, mm. people don't understand this, but it's crazy. It's like, Let's say that you come from a, a you know, family full of fathers that are like really aloof and all the kids within the family line are damaged because of that aloof parenting and you become the person who's able to actually convey emotional connection to your children. That changes the way that parenting happens. That changes the place they decide to live. That changes the jobs they decide to go for. Therefore, the affluence they're experiencing. You've literally altered the entire course of a story that has been going on since the beginning of time. I mean, yeah. it is so profound that when you really wrap your head around it, it's like, this is so, like, how are we not running around from the top of mountains, <laughs> like, yelling about how amazing this is, you know? And I, it's like, I want people to, t to tap into that, how incredible the picture of, of that is, including how, you know, precious and special the picture of their existence is. I mean, mm. when you sit here for a minute and you think about the fact that for most of us, we don't exist. If there's not this cacophony of or orchestra of different like circumstances happening, you know, it's the kind of thing where like if your third great grandfather didn't get on that ferry at that moment and oh my gosh, how lucky he missed his previous ferry, you don't exist. Mm. Mm. Just like just like the same thing's true. You don't exist if on the you know woman's side. Her sister moved to a new town, so she had to get on that ferry. Oh, lucky that the parents orchestrated that marriage. Otherwise, you wouldn't exist. It's literally like, when you sit here and you think about how each generation to exist and to create progeny, the amount of things that had to go just so for you to exist, it's like, oh my, how could I not understand how special, mm. right? How special yeah. I am. Have you are you familiar with the comic Watchmen? Do you know that one? No. There's a scene in it that is this. It's 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 that sentiment expressed. The trillions of possibilities of you know of everything that had to happen for you to come to life and for you not to believe in miracles is is just a oh. you don't believe and and what is what is self evident. And it's a beautiful scene um, in there that I'm reminded of with your passion especially <laughs> for it. Um, I wanted to share an interesting one. So it might have been based on your video. I I, I know very little about my grandparents. They're they're passed away. I, I knew them when they were alive, but we didn't talk about their life before me. Um, and I found out that I knew my dad, but my grandpa had unsuccessfully started a public speaking business. <laughs> and my dad was uh, not a public speaking, but was sort of like a jilted entrepreneur. And as I look back and uh, based on your video, I was like, there's this line in the men of um, frustrated ambition, I would say, which is like, and I feel uh, blessed and lucky to have grown up in a time where I don't think I could have succeeded in 1980 or 1950 or 19 whatever, but to have had all the resources that were available to me in 2010 was just like, I, I feel uh, incredibly lucky. And to it, it does feel like it needed to shift, like something in that line. And I see the frustration that it created in my grandpa and my dad. And uh, I hope not to have that when I when I ha <laughs> have kids, because I know how that affected our relationships and their relationships. It was just this like close but no cigar thing with trying to make shit happen in the world. Yep. Um, so I, 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 can, I can see the value of going into it. Oh, good.
Yeah, it's yeah. really, it's really, I mean, it's deep, but it's really fun. Like, this is one mm -hmm. of those, the, a lot of the things when it comes to self-awareness and stuff like that, it's like really rewarding after the fact, but it's like very mm. challenging up front. This is a very different experience. It's like, mm. oh my gosh, that just changed my world. It's amazing to, ah, 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 you know, it's really, really cool. So, yeah. <laughs> well, I appreciate the enthusiasm that you bring to the topic more than anything. Um, that's, that's awesome. So I know you have a course on that. Okay. Um, is what else should people check out of you? I know we've got your YouTube channel, the course, anything else that you would recommend? Yeah, I mean, I've, I'm obviously doing events all the time for people who are interested in coming to that. If you go to tealswan.com, that's where we collect every one of the things that I'm doing. But I, if I had to pick one thing out of books and paintings and, you know, courses and things like that, it would be that people go to my YouTube channel because... Mm. You know, that YouTube channel really started as my way of trying to get as much information out to the public as I possibly could in ways that I thought would help them. So it's like, I have so many videos now because I've been doing this for so many years on so many different subjects. It provides like a rabbit hole for people to go down on whatever subject is really igniting them or whatever they might be struggling with at a given time. And it's just like a fire hose of free info. So mm. that would Yeah. And I, I, I've uh, really enjoyed the YouTube channel. And I will say for anybody watching, like... You might not know what you're getting into with some of the titles. Fragmentation, like what what am I getting into? But uh, I first got connected to the psycho, like the psychoanalysis, psychological ones, which are really cool. And then there's all the way up to we only touched on some of the uh, the more uh, all encompassing spiritual stuff that you share on there. So wherever you fall on the spectrum of interested and not for me, you can find something. I promise you, if you're a fan of my podcast, so I, I recommend it as well. Um, but thank you very much for taking the time, Teal. It's good to be here. Thank you.